Welcome back. Today we're going to continue our journey to Quant5 on QuantGuild.com. Going to go ahead and get started here. Take us straight to the dashboard already logged in. In our previous episode, we answered a bunch of probability questions and we were able to rank up to 53 in probability. Today we're going to answer some math questions and hopefully increase our math rank. Going to go ahead and click the practice button here to get started. The first question, let capital F of X equal to the integral of zero to X squared of sine of T dt. Find F prime of X using the fundamental theorem of calculus and the chain rule. It's a great question. We'll take this over to the iPad and solve it together. This is quite a fun question to start with. We are given that capital F of X is equal to the integral from zero to X squared of sine of T dt. And we wanna find the derivative of this function using the chain rule and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, let's recall the fundamental theorem of calculus. Fundamental theorem of calculus suggests the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a, where this capital F is referred to as the antiderivative or the integral of little f of x. That is our integrand. How can we use this to solve the question, what is the derivative of the given function of an integral? Well, this is of the same form of the function that we are given. The fundamental theorem of calculus gives us an integral and relates it to the antiderivative of the integrand. What is the upside of this? Well, we're not looking for the solution to this integral, really. We're, we're not at all. We're not looking to evaluate this function. We are looking for the derivative of that function. The derivative of that function. So effectively, the left-hand side of the fundamental theorem of calculus here is the capital F of X that we are given in the problem statement. So what does that mean? Well, let's just go ahead and take the derivative of both sides of this equation. If we do this, we will get d dx, the integral from a to b, f of x dx is equal to d dx, f of b minus f of a. And what you'll notice here is if we take the derivative of the antiderivative, what are we gonna get? We're gonna get the integrand. We're gonna get the integrand. So this is going to be equal to, well, if we differentiate, let's just remember this relationship here. If we differentiate the antiderivative, we're gonna get the original function. And you better believe if we integrate that little f, we are going to get this capital F. That is the relationship here. So when I apply this derivative, what am I left with? I'm simply just left with little f of x. So this is going to be equal to little f of b minus little f of a. But are we done? Is this it? Well, this is it if we have a scalar bound of integration, but we don't. We don't, we have x squared in the upper limit of integration. So we must also take the derivative of that and multiply it to the upper limit. That is this f of b. So effectively, let's apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to this problem. And we will also use the chain rule with the upper limit. We know that this relationship is true. We just showed this is true. So we are given that f of x is equal to the integral from zero to x squared of sine of t dt. And we are looking for f prime of x, which is equal to d over dx, the integral from zero to x squared sine of t dt. But what does this look like? This is 
exactly what we showed here from the fundamental theorem of calculus. In this case, b is equal to x squared and a is equal to zero. Knowing this, we can jump straight to this result. f of b minus f of a. So this is equivalent to little f of x squared minus little f of zero. But, 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 this is a variable limit. We must apply the chain rule and differentiate that as well. So this is going to be f of x squared times the derivative of x squared. So this is quite easy to evaluate now because we know what little f of x is. Little f of x is our integrand. That is, we have little f of x is equal to sine of x here. This is probably abusive notation with the x's, but please bear with me. Come on down here. This is going to be equivalent to sine of x squared. And the derivative of x squared is simply going to be 2x minus sine of zero. And I sure hope you remember your precalculus that that is in fact zero, leaving the answer to be 2x sine of x squared. And that would be capital F prime of x using the chain rule and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Far fewer things more satisfying than getting a question correct on quant guild, 2x sine x squared. Boom, we are in fact correct. You can see the explanation down here. That is exactly how we went about solving it using the fundamental theorem of calculus and the chain rule. And we can move on to the next question. Find the area of the region bounded by y equals x squared and y equals four. This is a great question and it starts to tee us up for more advanced probability questions when we start looking at different types of probability density functions and joint density functions. So let's head on over to the iPad and solve this question together. This is a pretty cool question. I've drawn a graph of the two functions here, y equals x squared and y equals four. And as we can see, they will intersect at two points and they will create a shaded region A, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the area of that shaded region. The first thing we need to figure out is where do these functions intersect? To do that, we're gonna set the functions equal to each other and see at what points do they intersect. Now, these functions are quite trivial, so you could probably just see that if you plug in plus or minus two to x squared, you'll end up with four and that's where they will intersect. But in general, how would we solve this? How would we solve this if they weren't trivial? We just set these two equations equal to each other. So I will say that x squared is equal to four. This would imply if I solve for x, x is equal to plus or minus the square root of four, which is equal to plus or minus two. And that is in fact where these two functions intersect at plus or minus two. So how do we find the area now, the area of the shaded region. Well, now we can integrate. Now we can integrate. So what we're gonna do to find the area of the shaded region is we are going to say that A is equal to the integral. And where are we gonna integrate from? Well, we're gonna integrate from negative two all the way to positive two. So we're gonna integrate from negative two all the way to positive two. And we want to take the absolute value of the difference in the functions. So I'm going to say the function 4 minus x squared. And these are just the functions <clears throat> that are effectively creating the bounds for our integration here. So remember, we don't have variable or functional bounds of integration. We are integrating from negative 2 to 2. But the function that we are integrating, that is what is variable, right? And what makes it variable is the fact that we are fixing this y equals four, and we are gonna be taking the difference of x squared as we progress from negative two to positive two. So in other words, we start integrating from negative two, and we know that the first function creating the shaded region here is y equals four, and then the bottom function here is going to be x squared. 
So that difference there is going to correspond to that area. And as we integrate across the entire region, we are going to accumulate all of this area. So that is how we can determine the bounds. I'm sorry, not the bounds of integration, but the order of the functions that we are going to be subtracting. So we have y equals four is greater than y equals x squared across this entire region, negative two to two. So what that means is we can drop then the absolute value, negative two to two of four minus x squared dx. And then if we go ahead and we just integrate, if we go ahead and we just integrate this function, we are going to get four x evaluated from negative two to two minus, and then we're gonna have x cubed divided by three from negative two to two. And then if we plug in two and negative two, we get four times two minus four times negative two minus two cubed, which is going to be eight over three. And this will be minus a minus eight over three. So then what is this equal to? This is going to be equal to eight plus eight minus eight over three plus eight over three. This will be equal to 16 minus 16 over three. So we got to put this in terms of three now. So if we multiply 16 times three, then we get 48 over three minus 16 over three. And this is going to be equal to 32 divided by three in whatever units we are dealing with. And that is how we can find the area of this shaded region here. So to sum up the steps, we figure out the functions that are creating this shaded region, find the points of intersection. So the functions are given to us explicitly, y equals x squared and y equals four. We find the points of intersection, then we create this integral and we figure out the region that we are integrating and the bounds of integration here are fixed. We're going from negative two to two because that encapsulates the entire shaded region on the x dimension. The y dimension, however, is variable because the y gap changes as we move across this x dimension. To account for that, we take the difference in the y equals four and the y equals x squared, and that difference accounts for the accumulation of area across that entire space. That's what we've done here. That's why we drop the absolute value, and that's how we end up with 32 over three units. Back on Quant Guild, we can see 32 over three units. I did forget the square on the iPad. I do apologize, but fortunately I can get away with it here. We'll submit this answer. We will in fact get it correct. And we do get the exact same explanation that we got when we solved it on the iPad. Here, very interestingly, it does reference symmetry. That's why our explanations are the best. Show you all the shortcuts, tips, and tricks. And I'm here to walk through each of these questions with you. We're gonna move on to the next one. A circular oil spill expands such that its radius increases at a constant rate of 0.5 m per minute. How fast is the area increasing when the radius is 10 meters? Let's head on over to the iPad and solve this one together. If we added some randomness, maybe impose some sort of joint density on this problem, it could be a great quant interview question. But for now, let's just go about solving it. I'll draw a little picture. Here's my perfectly circular oil spill changing at a rate of dr dt is equal to 0.5 m over minutes. So this is the rate in which the radius is going to be expanding. And we are looking at the rate of change of the area when the r is equal to 10 m. When the r, the radius is equal to 10 M. So we know it's going to be expanding at a certain rate. And we are asking a question about what is the change in the area? What is the rate of increase in the area at R is equal to 10 M? Well, what is the area? We have a perfectly circular oil spill. So hopefully it's apparent that a is in fact equal to 
pi r squared, simple area of a circle. We're going to differentiate this with respect to t. So d of a of d of t is equal to pi. And then if we take the derivative, we're going to get 2r. But of course, we're differentiating with respect to t. So we're left with this dr dt. Now we can just substitute in all of the information. So we know that r is equal to 10. That is our point of interest. We know the rate of change. This is equal to 0.5 m per minute. So that would imply, that would imply that we get dA dt is equal to pi 2 times 10 times 0.5. And of course, I'm going to leave the units here. 10 m, 0.5 m per minute. And this will leave us with 0.5 times 10 is 5 times 2 is 10. 10 pi m squared divided by minutes, divided by minutes. You get the gist. This will be the rate of increase of the area when r is in fact equal to 10 m. Let's head on back over to the platform, see if that's an answer choice. And aha, we get answer choice B. I'm sorry, answer choice C. That was almost a problem. 10 pi m squared min submit. We do in fact get this one correct here. We get the explanation, which is exactly how we went about solving the problem. Let's head on back over to our dashboard and we have increased our math rank by one point. We are on our way to quant five, on our way to quant five. I hope you enjoyed this video as we continue our journey to quant five on quantkill.com, mastering our quantitative skills. In our next episode, we are going to be answering a whole bunch of finance questions, a whole bunch of finance questions, and hopefully we can rank up our finance skills. If we take a look at our performance overview, we are still at 100% accuracy. I'm hoping that we can keep this up the whole way along our journey, but some of these questions are going to get quite challenging. We will see what we can do. We will see what we can do. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.